the way. Jeremiah says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for hope and for a good future. In the midst of a world where there's not a whole lot to encourage you, the uplook gets brighter every day. Can you say amen? amen? On one occasion, the psalmist said he had kind of lost confidence in all that was happening, and his, his perspective had become negative and overwhelming. He couldn't understand why good people had difficult times. He couldn't understand why the righteous were being uh, uh, marginalized and, and hindered. But it says, Then I went into the sanctuary... And I understood. You know, when you get in the presence of God, you get the real story as it really is. You know, the Bible is His story. Let's say it together. The Bible is His story. History is God's story. Amen. If you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. We had a funeral yesterday, and I knew that I would be preaching this morning. I spent a great deal of time getting this ready, and then when I got home, I realized there was an area of that message that I really didn't touch, that I needed to touch, and I just reworked it. My wife said to me, she said, well, how long is it going to take you? She wanted some company, and I said, I've got to do it till I get through. And I said, I just want to know in my heart that I need to put the emphasis where God has told me to put it. I literally am going to be looking at various parts of First Chronicles 12. So if you brought your Bible or a cell phone, you can just keep it open because we're just going to look at First Chronicles 12 and point out some highlights. I want to talk to you today on the subject, Warriors of the King. Warriors of the King. Let's just turn to First Chronicles 12. 38, and I want to read that from the New Living Translation, and I want to also read it from the message paraphrase. All these men came in battle array to Hebron, or some would say Hebron, with a single purpose of making David king of Israel. In fact, all of Israel agreed that David should be their king. Let's read that from the message paraphrase. Now, notice I said it's, it's a paraphrase. It's not a translation. And you don't build doctrine on paraphrases. How many heard what I said? All these soldiers came to David at Hebron ready to fight if necessary. They were both united and determined to make David king over all Israel. And everyone else in Israel was of the same mind. Make David king. Would you just agree with me that God will speak to us today and give us God's word. And that God will speak to us as a corporate body. And that God will speak to us individually. And that God will meet needs today, and God will encourage, and God will come and show Himself strong before the service is over. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank You for the song that You gave to hope. Thank You, Lord, that You are a foundation. Lord, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And we know that all other ground is sinking sand. In the midst of a world that is drowning without and drowning in hopelessness. God, would you give us hope today? Would you speak to us? God, would you minister to us on this 4th of July weekend? Would you come and walk up and down these aisles in the person of the Holy Spirit? 
Would you visit every one of us today, Lord, and would you give us that that we need from you? Help me, Lord, today not to speak as just an ordinary man, but help me, Lord, to speak as the oracles of God. Help me, Lord, to recognize unless you build the house that all that we attempt to do in our own strength is totally inadequate. Holy Spirit, would you come and energize? Would you come and break down walls? Would you bring conviction and encouragement, Lord, and whatever is needed today, Father, would you do it for us both collectively as a body and as individuals today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk today on the subject, Warriors of the King. David had been anointed king at Hebron. As the word spread, men began to pour into the town of Judah to attach themselves to David and to the cause that he represented. As you read 1 Chronicles 12, you'll discover that these were special men, men that were raised up by God to install David as king over all Israel. In the spirit of valor and courage, they journeyed to the highest city in the land, and they arrived there to proclaim him as king. These men were brave and mighty warriors, and they came to help their leader become the greatest king of all the earth. David was a man of compassion. He was a man that was highly skilled. He was courageous and worthy of their full devotion. He had been chosen by God to be first in a royal lineage destined to lead to the ideal king, the eternal king, Jesus Christ, the king of all kings. Really want to build my message today around the thought that these men exemplified truth. What is it that really is so relevant in 1 Chronicles 12? And what does it have to say to us today? What does those brave men that rallied around David have to do with us in the year 2018? I believe that their dramatic story is recorded in our Scripture for our own admonition. You see, when you read the Old Testament especially, it says these things were written for our admonition and for our learning. Not only do we learn from people's strengths, but we also learn from their times when they fumble the ball and they make mistakes. Now, if you and I were writing the story, we would only pick out the people that we thought were successful, only those that brought honor and, and majesty to the, to, the, to the Word of God. But you see, God tells it like it is. And we learn both from their strengths as well as from their weaknesses. How can we as disciples of Jesus Christ in the year 2018 learn from these great men? How can we serve King Jesus in a more committed and a disciplined manner? As I've studied accounts of these brave warriors, there are four distinguishing characteristics or qualities which all of God's people should possess. And I want to make this the main thrust of my message this morning. Now, I only I had originally three points, but I, I felt that I had left out probably the most important part. And I spent the rest of the afternoon, and matter of fact, till about 9 o'clock last night, just really pouring over that last area and saying, God, just do something to help me just wrap it up and, and, and make an impact. You may want to jot down these words. First of all, as I observe these men, I discover that they are men of commitment. The first characteristic of David's men is that they were men of a total commitment to a cause. They came to David to help with an undivided loyalty. 
they were also fully determined to make David king over all Israel. Their commitment to him was single-minded and wholehearted. Let me remind all of us today that God is still looking for those kind of individuals. He's on the lookout that he may show himself strong in behalf of those kind of people. So God is here today looking for those individuals. Those who possess one heart and one mind to make Jesus Christ king over their lives and the lives of others. The church of Jesus Christ desperately needs those kind of people in this hour. A man that I have great respect for that's now going to be with the Lord. A man that was the founder of the Navigators. That was a, uh, that was a group of people whose primary goal and thrust in life was to make disciples. And for a number of years, I received monthly a publication called Discipleship. His name was Dawson Trotman. And I quote, God can do more through one man who is 100% committed to him than he can do through 100 who are only 90% committed to him. That's why the Bible says that God is looking for a man who will stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Notice that David's men were not only committed to him personally, they were also committed to a mission. They joined with others on the same commitment to see David installed as king over all Israel. And I submit to you that I cannot, that you and I cannot be fully committed to Jesus Christ without being committed to him and to his mission on planet earth. I'll never forget Years ago, a sign that I saw in a Washington march, and by the way, if you're following the news, they're having a lot of marches across our nation. Well, if you live in the Washington, D.C. area, something like that goes on probably every day of the year. But this was a large march there led by Martin Luther King. By the way, a peaceful march. A lot of people call themselves followers of Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther King was a strong advocate of nonviolence. Hello? But I saw in this great crowd of people a sign that read this. Jesus, yes. The church, no. I want to tell you, friend, that's a paradox. If it's Jesus, yes. It's the church, yes. I say that it's, if Jesus is yes, his church is yes. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus spoke to Peter after his resurrection on three occasions and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. He asked him the second time, Peter, do you love me more than any of these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know all things. I love you. Finally, the third time, Peter got a little aggravated and said, Lord, I'm reading between the lines. He probably said, you've already asked me twice, and I've given you the answer. You know all things. And finally, Jesus said, Peter, if you really love me, I want you to go and feed my sheep. In other words, he was saying, Peter, if you really love me, and if you have come under my authority as a disciple, if you really believe in the great commission that I've already given to you, you can show your love to me by going and being involved in the mission of carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. So these men were committed to a mission. Every one of us that profess allegiance to Jesus Christ face two choices regarding personal commitment. We must choose between the pursuit of comfort or a cause. If we prefer comfort, we eliminate ourselves from Christ's service with its demands and hardships. 
if we desire to live for a cause, other choices present themselves. We must between we must decide between the cause of Jesus Christ and all the other causes which the world presents. The cause of Jesus Christ and taking his message of salvation to the ends of the earth is still the greatest cause in all the world. I wonder today if we're like David's men that were committed to him and proclaiming him king. Do we serve him with undivided devotion? Listen to the words of Paul as he wrote to Timothy. Some of the last things he said to him, he said, No man that warreth entangling himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I like the Phillips translation. It reads this way. No soldier on active service gets himself entangled in business or he will not please his commanding officer. The Amplified Bible renders it this way. No soldier when in service gets entangled in the enterprise of civilian life. His aim is to satisfy and please the one who enlisted him. And I believe if God could speak to us this morning, he would call us to a place of undivided commitment. He would call us as he called Peter and said, Peter, if you really love me, go and feed my disciples. Go and be engaged in the greatest cause under heaven, the cause of proclaiming the saving name of Jesus Christ to every creature. For you see, ladies and gentlemen, God has ordained that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. That's our mission. Number two, I'm going to leave out some of this because I want to share with you the real thrust. Okay? Well, where am I? Competence. The second outstanding characteristic of David's men was their competence in battle. Notice as you read that chapter, it talks about that they were experts in doing battle with the enemy. Let me just read you some of the comments that you'll find in describing these great warriors. They were all mighty men of valor. They were all armed with bows and could use both the right and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of bows. Men of war fit for the battle that that could handle shield and buckler buckler whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rose upon the mountain what are you reading that for i'm just telling you those were the kind of men that responded to david they were very competent warriors who knew what to do and how to do it and i believe that that god is calling us to be those kind of individuals i've, I've always been intrigued where Paul encountered a man that, uh, the seven sons of Sceva that were trying to practice exorcism. You'll read about it in Acts 19. It says that that, uh, they came to this man and said, in the name of Paul's God, come out of him. And those evil spirits came out and leaped on that man and tore his clothes off. Now you can't help but laugh at that a little bit. You better make sure when you start playing exorcist, exor, uh, becoming the exorcist, that you really have the power of God to deliver people. Can you say amen? And the Bible says he ran through the streets. And those demons said as, as they encountered that man, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you? Paul I know and Jesus I know But who are you? We must recognize the profound difference between merely being in the army and being a skilled warrior. And unfortunately, many Christians are raw recruits when when it comes to spiritual warfare. Therefore, my son, Paul writes to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Endure hardness as a good soldier. 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. I want to call special attention this morning to the men of Zebulon as an example of good, competent soldiers. I find there are three things that describe them. First of all, they were experienced soldiers prepared for battle. Being a good soldier just doesn't happen. It requires discipline and it requires training and the ability to work well with others. For you see, the success of a good army is the ability to serve in a united effort. Let me share with you some examples of what unity and togetherness and being assimilated together really mean. Psalm 133, 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant is it is for brethren. And let me add to the scripture, okay? And I want to add another word in there. Brethren and sistren. that okay? God wants his body to be together in unity. How good, and it goes on to describe what happens when there's a sense of a one accordness and, and agreement and a togetherness. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. You see, ladies and gentlemen, lone rangers will not make good soldiers in the army of the Lord. You can't be an individual. You have to assimilate yourself into a body. And that's a part of what we call discipleship. Now, our church is good in a lot of things. Can I be real candid with you this morning and tell you the truth? One of our weaknesses is in discipleship. Oh, we call it assimilation. We're real good at greeting people and hugging one another and saying, everybody's beautiful. But sometimes we haven't sat down on, sometimes on a one-on-one -on -one basis or in a small group and says, I want to teach you what it means to be a child of God. I want you to walk where I walk. I want you to walk in the steps that I've walked in. That's what a disciple is. A disciple says, a disciple ought to be able to, a discipler should be able to say to a would-be disciple, you follow me as I follow Jesus. Now let me step down where I can really get down and see the white of your eyes. I used to tell folks at First Assembly, and I would say the same thing to you today. You owe me absolutely nothing if I deviate from God's Word. I used to say to the folks, I can only lead you to the cemetery. That's as far as I can take it. You need someone greater than I am. But I believe that God raises up pastors and gives them ability. And, and the same thing that Paul said to Timothy... Timothy, you follow me as I follow Jesus. And there ought to be enough people in our congregation that are mature enough to take a new convert by the hand and simply say, I'm going to teach you what it means to be a, a stabilized, uh, steady, faithful child of God. Hello? We desperately need that we need to make disciples let's say it together we need to make disciples not little miniature Jerry Halls or John Hages or David Jeremiah's huh we need to make disciples of Jesus Hallelujah. 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 You still glad you came today? Let me pause for a commercial here. The 
these men of Zebulun were, profi were proficient in every type of weapon. They were, they were individuals with indiv undivided loyalty. They were fixed in their purpose. They were not divided or distracted in their loyalties. They were not of a double mind. And then most of us know a little bit more about courage. And so if you're taking notes, the third uh, C, and by the way, I had it all beautiful and laid out so you could remember with all starting with C's, but I messed it up on the fourth one. They were men with great courage. They were not paralyzed by fear. Some of us today perhaps are paralyzed by fear. Some are fearful of what God might require of them. Others may be dealing with the problem of they're, they're afraid of what somebody else will think about them. Or they're afraid of what they may miss if they make a total commitment to Jesus Christ and to allow Him to become the master of their lives. If you lack courage today, God desires to speak to us as He spoke to Joshua. Thou shalt, not, thou, thou shalt not allow any man to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Let me remind you today that the God of Joshua has not changed. Now, to that last area that I felt so very strongly. And by the way, let me just share this with you. Those three points that I preached, I preached at a church several years ago after I had left First Assembly and was doing guest preaching and interim ministry. I was invited, I think it was on a Memorial Day weekend. Pastor and I was uh, good friends, and he said, would you come and preach for me? I'm going to be away. And that church happened to be a church that were pacifist. They were conscientious objectors. And I noticed it was kind of quiet that day. And I was talking about warriors of the king. I laughed about that as I thought about the message that I was going to preach today. I, I went back to that time. And evidently, that message didn't go down too well because the offering wasn't very good either. <laughs> but this area that I, that I felt so strongly about, my last thought today, we need a keen sense, we need keen sensitivity and a sense of spiritual discernment. You may want to jot that down. We need a keen sensitivity and a sense of spiritual discernment. Notice, listen to these words spoken of the sons of the, uh, from those of the tribe of Issachar. 1 Chronicles 12, 32. From the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders. All these men understood the temper of the times. And knew the best course for Israel to take. In other words, if I could bring that to today's vernacular, I would simply say those men had deep spiritual insight. They had a perception of what was taking place and what was going to take place. They had an insight that most others didn't have. They had spiritual discernment. These men of Issachar are given special mention, I believe, because discerning God's purposes and timing is necessary in order to cooperate with God and hold on to a God-given vision during times of uncertainty or change. We are in a time of change. We're in a transition. So we need deep sensitivity. We need discernment. We need direction. We need to believe that God has a leader that God has already begun to speak to and will come and lead us from now to where we need to go. 
I remember an old song that they used to sing, My Lord knows the way through the wilderness and all that I need for tomorrow. Strength for today is mine all the way and all that I need for tomorrow. He knows the way. Hallelujah. What are some of the lessons that we can learn from these men of Issachar? First of all, my first observation, know where God is moving. They saw that God had selected a new king, and they aligned themselves to David. They didn't say, well, I don't like the way David dresses. I don't like the way he cuts his hair. I don't like this and that and the other. They recognized that here was a man that God had raised up. And they said, we're on board. We're on board. This is God's will. This is God's direction. He's the king. And we're going to go and lend our total support. They had a plan. Secondly, we as a church are not like a hot air, a hot air balloon. Driven by the winds of opinion and unable to choose our own course. We're more like a sailboat. We have a rudder that lets us take the power of wind and use it to go in the direction I believe that God is choosing for WCWC. How many still believe that the wind still blows? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we need to get caught up in the wind of God. And the wind of God will take us where we need to go. The wind of God has been blowing across the assemblies of God since 1914 when they embraced the motto, It's not by might nor by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord. That's the wind of God. That began to blow the day of Pentecost. And it takes that same kind of wind to move us on today. Hallelujah. 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 Thirdly, we must see where God is moving today and embrace the fresh movements of the Spirit that are happening around the world. Yes, sir, don't you forget it, friend. God is moving around the world and the wind is blowing across many continents. Africa being a good example. Tanzania, they're in the midst of a tremendous revival. They're in revival in India. They're in revival. I talked to the forest missions leader of the Assemblies of God a couple of years ago. And he shared with me a nation that for all practical purposes is close to the gospel that has probably two to three million people that meet in secret, that love Jesus Christ. That's the wind of the Spirit that blows. Hallelujah. Number four, and we need to underline this one. We must always make sure that we are biblically driven and not measured by that we do not measure ministry by what the world calls success. As I mentioned in our Bible study on, on the life of Philip, we must ask God for a very sensitive heart during this transition. And I appeal to you today to make a daily prayer request for the church board and the pastoral search committee. They need our prayers that God will give them spiritual discernment and sensitivity as they search for God's will in providing us for a new pastor. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do that on a regular basis. And then we need to pray for our worship team and those that lead the worship service that they'll be sensitive to the flow and to the move of God, that God's will will be done. Then we need to pray for those, whether they're interim pastor or, or the pastor to come. We need to pray for them that as they stand to speak the word of God, that they have heard from God and they will be able to come and say, I have a message. I believe that I have the word of God for today. You say, I'm not interested in just preaching sermons. I got a, lot of, I got a large collection of sermons. But I need to know in my heart 
beyond a shadow of a doubt when I step to the pulpit that I've heard from God and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is God's word for today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of us that come to the house of God, let me ask you, let me implore you, let me beg you in the name of Jesus, especially on Saturday. And if it takes getting up an extra 15 or 20 minutes, get out on your knees and say, Lord, prepare my heart that I may receive from God today everything you want me to receive. Help me to be able to enter in. You see, the worship team... They may have sought God, and they may have got the right songs, and I believe they had them today. But you see, their response is not to try to hype up something. Their, their, their responsibility is to worship God themselves and lead us by example into the presence of God. Hello? They're not there to entertain us. I said, they're not there to entertain us. We don't have any superstars here. They all do a good job. But they've come to lead us into the presence of God. And we walk through these doors. We're to walk through these doors with a sense of awe and say, I've come to the house of God to worship God and get in in the very first of us chorus and begin to align ourselves with God. It's amazing how much more we get out of the service if we put something in. Woo! Hallelujah. I'm just a delivery boy. Let me pause for a commercial for the last time. My goal was to be through by 11.30. Now I'm, I'm well on the way. You know, it's been my experience over 50 years as a pastor. It's been my experience that one of the hardest things to keep going in a church is prayer meetings. I believe God spoke to my heart. I believe God spoke to my heart and said, are you willing to start prayer meeting on, Wednesday night, uh, on Monday night again? You said, did you clear that with temporary chairman? Yes, I did. I believe in doing things the right way. <laughs> Hello? It's going to be a prayer meeting. We're going to focus our attention probably in four areas. We're going to focus our attention, first of all, on the need of America. America desperately, desperately needs a sovereign move of God. If not, we're in trouble. We need to pray for our nation and pray for God to somehow drive back the power and the spirit of Antichrist and let revival flow across America. Then we're going to pray concerning Ohio for Jesus. We're going to pray for our church that God will send us a pastor that he has already ordained. I still believe that. I believe in the process, but I believe in the good, I believe in the chief shepherd. How many know who he is? I said, I believe in the chief shepherd. And I'm just an under shepherd, but he's a chief shepherd. So we're going to believe that the chief shepherd will use the process to bring us the kind of pastor that he's already ordained. And we need to pray for the persecuted church. I had conversation this past week with a dear friend that I was in India with that's built schools there, that's trekked up the mountains there into Nepal and, and built churches there. He told me now that he can no longer get a visa to go in there to do any kind of religious activity. He can only go as a tourist. And he's devoted about 40 years of his life in missionary evangelism. 
He loves God with a deep passion, and he loves the people of, of India and Nepal. Unbelievable. And he's just a little bit younger than I am. He sent me an appeal because he's got to go back and, and deal with the situation there. So this is, this is the kind of people. We're going to pray for the persecuted church around the world. And when you arrive at 7 o'clock, there will be prayer requests available. We're not going to have any music. We're not going to have any talking. We're just going to pray. How many heard what I said? We're just going to pray. And if you can't come, set aside. If your work schedule is not conducive, I don't want to put anybody on a guilt trip. That's not where I'm coming from. And we're not going to take attendance. You see, you never, you never take attendance at prayer meeting because it'll discourage you. You just let that rest with God. Hello? Every man is accountable for himself. Can you say amen to that? That okay? So we're not going to be checking up on you. We're not going to be calling you and say, I didn't see you at prayer meeting. We're just going to invite you to come and pour out your heart to God. And I'll guarantee you, the Bible says, my house shall be called what? Say it with me. House of prayer. We're going to ask you to come and join us on Monday nights. I'll see you Monday night. Lord willing, the creek don't rise. <laughs> Let me wrap up with this last statement. I, I had this in my file. If I've used this here before, most of you wouldn't remember it. So <laughs> I used to have a lady at Lima first that would always put in the margin. You see, if you serve a church very long, you have to be careful that you don't repeat yourself too much. She would always put in the margin of the Bible the day that I preached it. She showed me her Bible. <laughs> My mom did that too. And so when you're there 20 years, you have to keep digging and digging and digging and digging and digging and digging. Amen? But this is in the file. Really spoke to my heart. It's called, I'm a disciple. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stopped. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of His. I won't look back, let go or slow down, back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I fini I'm finished and done with now low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees. Colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops. This is small print, by the way, in case you're wondering. Recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on His presence. I walk by patience. Lifted up by prayer. And I labor by the power of the Holy Spirit. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My God is reliable. My mission is clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot be compromised. I cannot be detoured, turned away, or turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of conflict, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy or ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. 
I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let go until I have, I have prayed up and paid up and preached up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes. Give till, it, till I drop. Witness until all may know the work of grace in their hearts. And when he comes for his own, I will have no problem. He will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. I am a fruit-bearing disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the passion of my heart. If you have any sensitivity, you understand that's the passion of my heart. That's why I made the statement years ago. It may not have happened that way. Everybody keeps asking me when I'm going to retire. And I said, I'm going to go with my shoes on. That's a passion of my heart. I'm a disciple. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. I've decided to be a disciple. When you read 1 Chronicles 12, think about those men that are examples and say, Lord, by the grace of God, I want to be like those people. I want to be known as a person that is undivided, a person that is loyal, a person that's committed to a cause. I want to be a part of those that welcome King Jesus back. Hallelujah. He's our king. He's our rightful king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I know that many of us have things to do today, but I don't know of any better thing to do than just make our way, just for a few moments, make our way and just stand around this altar. Let's just begin to move out of the altar, around the altar area. Let's begin to move this way. And let's just say, Lord, I really want to be like those men and women there in, in 1 Chronicles 12. I want to be a disciple. I want to, I want to make a difference I want sensitivity. I want to be a part of those that have undivided loyalty to the King of Kings. That's it. Just begin to move this way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.